How many of you believe that if we apply the Word of God to our lives, that we can do life better? It's true, isn't it? I mean, God has given us His Word for one reason, and that is to help us do life better. And if we apply what the Word tells us, we will do life better. Applying it is the challenge. We can easily read it. We can even memorize it, as many pseudo-Christian sects are good at doing, but then applying it can be a different thing. And so this morning, we're going to talk about some things that might help us. You know, most people will agree that uh, the human brain is an incredible organ. But you know what? Better than the human brain is the human mind. You know, in fact, the human mind is without doubt God's, you know, masterpiece of creation. You see, no other creature has what we have been given. I mean, you know, they may have bodies uh, and brains like we do, but they don't have minds like the human mind. And the problem, of course, with our minds, however, is that, you know, they do tend to do their own thinking. And not all of that thinking is good. Sometimes our minds can get quite out of control and take us where we don't want to go. They can start thinking in ways um, that we don't um, want and in ways that can actually uh, become destructive. As incredible as our minds may be, uh, if we don't learn to manage them uh, or control them, they can, in a sense, really become a handicap. For example, with some people, their minds uh, may tend to lean uh, towards the negative. And so without meaning to, their minds get filled with negative and pessimistic thoughts that then control their lives. And at the other end of the scale are people who tend to have minds that lean more to thinking positive uh, or optimistic thoughts. And of course, somewhere in between those two ends of the scale is where most people actually live. Now, there's no doubt that the mind um, is an an incredibly powerful thing. But it does need to be controlled, and it can be. It can be managed, shaped, and taught to have a right mental attitude. In Christ, we can do all things, and that includes training our mind to think the right way. Now, I'm sure that most of us have heard about the power of positive thinking. It was a minister from New York by the name of Norman Vincent Peale who actually popularized the term uh, some years ago. And since he started teaching about positive thinking, in one way or another, a similar message of positive thinking has been promoted by books and seminars all over the world countless times. And of course, many people have found this message to be helpful for living their lives in a more optimistic way. And while positive thinking uh, can in some ways be taken to the extreme, it certainly is always more beneficial than negative thinking. It has been shown that developing a positive mental attitude in the workplace, for example, will increase productivity and cause staff to feel more you know, personal satisfaction with their work life. However, the benefits of a positive attitude are not limited to the workplace. I mean, they apply to every area of our life. They apply equally well at home, uh, at school, and in church. If your home is a negative environment, then guess what? Your kids will leave as soon as they're old enough. And don't be surprised when they don't want to visit after they have left. Likewise, if a church becomes negative, it will soon end up um, with only grumbling dissatisfied people. Uh, Because after all, who wants to fellowship with negativity? No one does. People with a positive mental attitude are far more enjoyable to be around than people with a negative mental attitude. Positive people are like people magnets. They attract others to them. In our text today, the Apostle Paul talks about the importance of the way that we think. And at first glance, it seems that he's encouraging us to develop a positive mental attitude. 
And while to a point this is true, uh, it's not all that he's doing. He's actually encouraging us as Christians to begin to think in a distinctively Christian way. And the reason why he's doing this is because our thinking matters a great deal. Our thinking affects how we live. Today's text from the book of Philippians presents some implications as well as a very explicit message. It implies several important truths and it also gives us some specific direction in how to think and therefore how to live. Now one of the um, implications of our text is that uh, ideas are powerful. And indeed they are. Ideas are so powerful that they very often outlive those who have them. And all you have to do to find out how powerful ideas are is to just take some time to read some of history. If you study history, you find that ideas have been uh, the driving force behind progress and indeed behind very much that has happened, both good and bad. Ancient Rome was an idea. The United States was an idea. Mao's cultural revolution in China was an idea. Hitler's kind of Germany was an idea that many Germans embraced. These ideas were powerful enough to outlive those who had them and powerful enough to continue to shape the course of civilization. Yes, ideas are powerful. Ideas have shaped history. Ideas shape your life. Some people have had a you know, very tough life for no other reason than because they made a string of bad ideas. It's also true that some people have missed out on great things because while they may have had a string of good ideas, they never managed to implement those ideas. Ideas are born out of thinking. And so if our thinking is right, then we will have good ideas that will prosper our lives. If our thinking is wrong, then we will get bad ideas that can sabotage our life. And I have lots of examples of when people have come to me with some idea that is just flawed, and I could see right through that, and yet they were convinced that it was the right thing to do. They even believed that God was showing them that that was the right thing to do, and then disaster happens because it wasn't a good idea. As believers, we need to encourage right thinking in each other, and we need to be reminded to think in a Christian way. We need to stimulate one another to think wholesomely so that we can have wholesome ideas. And you know what? Good fellowship will help us in this regard. Something that we're trying to promote. Because Jesus in me can rub off on Jesus in you, and Jesus in you can rub off on Jesus in me, and we come out as winners. We come out as better equipped. But the best way to stimulate right thinking is with the Word of God. A key function of the Word of God is to renew our thinking and make it wholesome. And some of us have needed a great deal of that to happen because we had stinking thinking. We had thinking that had been polluted by our past, by our journey in life without God. And so we then come into a relationship with God and God needs to renew our thinking. He needs to change how we think from how we used to to how we now have to as followers of Jesus Christ. And Peter tells us this in 2 Peter 3 verse 1. He says, Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. So he's referring to the Word of God. I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. And so reading the Word of God stimulates us into wholesome thinking. See, when we have wholesome thinking going on in our minds, we will have wholesome ideas. And wholesome ideas have the power to influence our lives in the right way. But the only reason any ideas have power is because our minds have power. Ideas are born in the mind. And so what our minds think really matters. Mental health professionals as well as medical doctors can tell you just how powerful our minds are. In fact, our mental condition can affect our physical condition. What you think about can actually make you sick or it, make, it can make you better. Spiritually speaking, our minds can become, you know, um, a battlefield for Satan. 
His main strategy from day one has been to gain control of our mind. You know, the, the, the lie that he spoke into Eve was designed to get her thinking in a certain way, and it worked. You see, if the devil can control how we think and what we think, he can control our behavior. In fact, that is the only way that he can actually have any real influence over Christians. He has no other power. You know, he's not going to physically come and shake you. <laughs> you know, he can't do that. But he can play with our mind. How do we know that? Because he tried to do it with Jesus. In the desert, he tried to mess with the mind of Jesus. He didn't physically touch him, but he was, everything that happened in that desert was all mind games that um, Satan was trying to influence Jesus with. And so, for example, he, if he can get us to believe a lie, then he can get us to behave in accordance with the lie that we have believed. For instance, if he can convince us that it is futile to believe that we can overcome a particular sin, then our best efforts will be hampered by doubt. If we swallow the lie, um, what then practically happens is that we do not expect to be victorious in that sinful area. In many cases, we will simply not really try to overcome because we don't really believe that we can have the victory. What we think or believe matters. Amen. It has been said that the average person uh, only uses about 10% of their minds. I wonder what would really happen if the other 90% was somehow activated. Perhaps when we all get to heaven, we will learn how to use the other 90%. Who knows what powers we might have hidden in that 90%. Perhaps we'll be able to communicate telepathically. We may even be able to read one another's minds. I'm glad that we can't do that here on earth. Frankly, I don't really want to know what everyone is thinking while I'm preaching. And there are times when I definitely don't want you to know what I'm thinking. The point is that even though we may only use a fraction of our minds, the little that we use is still very powerful. Our thoughts shape our lives. What we believe determines how we behave. How we look at the world and think about the world determines how we will respond to our circumstances and to other people. Our thoughts have a way of determining what we will become. In other words, what we focus our thinking on will have the power to determine how we end up living as far as that thing that we're focusing on is concerned. Because there is such influential power in our minds, we have to be careful about the thoughts that we let our minds produce or run with. If the mind has such power, then we need to examine another implication of our text, and that is the power of negative thinking. The power of negative thinking is the power to destroy and tear down. A negative or cynical perspective is very good at destroying hope. Negative thinking is a trap for many people. With some, it's like they have a natural tendency to think negatively. Given the choice, uh, you know, we all know about that example of, of, the, of the glass. You know, some people will always see the glass as half empty and others will see it as half full. But what happens when you begin to focus on the negative? You know, what happens when you adopt a cynical perspective towards life? What happens when you're always focusing on what's wrong, always focusing on the problems, always focusing on what's not quite right? Well, the first thing that happens is that your spirit starts turning sour. You slowly start becoming a negative person. You begin to grumble and complain about things. And you know what? Eventually, you just grumble about everything. Nothing is good enough. Nothing's right enough. You may become suspicious and untrusting. You may not even notice that this is happening at first, but the result of this is that before you know it, you become a miserable person who also makes others miserable. You quit enjoying life because you can't. 
You quit enjoying the relationships you have with other people, and soon enough you start driving people away. You see, no one likes to be around a negative, cynical person. If you're like that, pay attention and you will notice um, when people see you coming that that, that they'll try to avoid you. Every one of us has our own issues to deal with. You know, we all have problems in life and, and none of us need anyone to add to our burdens with their negativity. We don't avoid negative people because we're rude uh, or unkind. We avoid them because we can't handle them. We avoid them because we want to protect ourselves. But here's the thing. Even a person with negative tendencies has the ability to choose what they will think about. You may not think this is true, and you may wonder how you can possibly keep negative thoughts from entering your mind... And that's true. You know, uh, we can't always stop negative thoughts from coming into our mind, especially when it's the devil who's trying to put them there. But when I say that you can choose what to think about, I mean you can choose what to dwell on. You may not be able to stop the negative idea from coming in, but you sure can (coughs) prevent doing anything about it. (laughs) You see, it's virtually impossible to keep some of those negative thoughts from popping into our mind, but you can choose not to dwell on those negative or sinful thoughts. You know, someone once said that you might not be able to stop the birds from flying over your head, but you sure can keep them um, from building a nest in your hair. And that's so true. You can choose to reject those negative thoughts when they come, just like you can choose to receive them. If you receive them and dwell on them, then guess what? You will become a negative person because negativity grows. It doesn't, we just don't go from one minute to the next being negative. It's something that we start developing like a bad habit. But if you reject negativity and refuse to dwell on those thoughts, you will be able to avoid their destructive influence. Negative thinking can become a habit. And most of us will know that habits are hard to break. But often the best way to break a habit is to replace it with another habit, preferably a good one. I think Paul tells us exactly this in our text from Philippians. It's like he's talking to those of us who do tend to to, um, uh, get into wrong thinking. And, And to those, he says, choose to think differently. He says to think positively because there is a power in positive thinking that adds to life. Let's read from our text um, from Philippians 4 verse 8. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. So the challenge is, what do we normally think about? Negative thoughts feed on each other, but so do positive thoughts feed on each other as well. And that's why negative people tend to grow more negative, while positive people tend to grow more positive. Paul says if things are top-notch, and worthy of praise, think about these. Invest your thoughts in what is excellent and praiseworthy. Clearly, this is a choice. Christian thinking doesn't come naturally to us. We have to train our minds to think this way. We're told in Romans 12 verse 2 that we can keep from being conformed to this world's thinking by the process of renewing our minds. Uh, Let's read it. Romans 12, verse 2. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Our renewed minds have the power to transform us if we feed them the right stuff. How do we renew our minds? By, well, we do it by feeding them new thoughts from the Word of God, from our Bibles. That's how we do it. That's how we deprogram 
deprogram ourselves from negativity. But a good question is, what are some of us feeding our minds with? What kinds of thoughts are being stimulated in our minds by the books that we read, by the TV that we watch, by the social media that we subscribe to, um, and by the conversations we listen to and participate in? What are we feeding our minds? What are we building in the well of our minds? Are we retraining our minds to conform to our old ways of the world? Or are we actually allowing God's Word to renew the way that we think? Most of us had years of worldly programming. And then after conversion, we need deep programming so that we can think and see the things the way that God wants us to see them. In other words, we must retrain ourselves to think in a distinctively Christian way. And this takes deliberate, intentional effort. And it also takes practice and consistency. For most of us, our thinking was pre-programmed like a bad habit over many years. Stopping a bad habit is not usually so easy. <laughs> the best way is to change the habit by replacing it with a good one. And so Paul tells us to focus on the positive, on what is good, excellent, and worthy of praise. What the great apostle Paul is talking about here is a key for tapping into the power of Christian thinking. You see, it's not enough to just simply reject negative thinking and then start focusing on everything that's positive. Instead, we must retrain our minds to focus on the things that God wants us to focus on. Notice those things that he emphasizes in verse 8. He mentions things that are true. Are we always truthful in what we say? Things that are honorable. Is everything that we do and get involved in honorable? Is everything that we do and say, um, would we be able to, to have them known to the whole world, to have them known to the whole church, to our neighborhood and our family? Is everything that we think about right? pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, and praiseworthy. In other words, he's asking us to reject thinking that is impure and unrighteous. Reject thinking that's ungodly. And he's asking us to embrace a new kind of thinking, thinking that is righteous and holy and positive. Christian thinking, you see, is hopeful thinking. Christian thinking is faith-filled thinking. As Christians, we put our trust in Jesus Christ. We believe that God is in control. We know that God loves us and knows what's best for us. And so we have reason to trust that he's working out his plan for our lives. We trust that he knows what he's doing even when we don't think so. And we can rest confident in that trust because God has proven to be trustworthy. Most of us will have examples of how God came through for us when we needed Him. Now, while others are filled with worry and wringing their hands, we're at peace with our faith in Christ, knowing that even when things don't seem to be going too well, that God is still in control. And so we can always see the light at the end of any dark tunnel we might find ourselves in. Through our faith and trust in Jesus, we have trust in His Word. And so when things are not going so well, we can know that the outcome will be okay because God says so in my favorite verse of all time. He says that in the end it will be okay. He says in Romans 8 verse 28, and I know I've quoted it a bit lately, but I love this verse, and it says that we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose for them. Awesome promise. This makes a difference, not only to us, but also to others who are watching our lives, watching to see if we walk what we preach, watching to see if we live out what we claim to believe. When people see Christians retain a positive outlook, even in hard times, they marvel. I mean, they may not talk to us about it, but, but they do notice. 
when they see people who are able to rise above the negativity that prevails in our culture, they notice the difference. And yes, we should be different. Christians should not think or live like the world does. Because we do live with a unrestricted access to a higher power that makes a huge difference in our lives. And his name is Jesus Christ. And so God has left us. He's left us in this world for a reason. He's left us here to be a testimony of His grace. We're here to show the world what it's like to be a Christian. Just like the Jews were to be an example to all of those back in the day when they roamed around. They were there to show all of the heathen nations what it's like to follow God. And today we're here to show what it's like to be a Christian. And therefore our challenge is to live our lives in such a way that when people look in to observe, they see something that is desirable. They see something in us and about us that they want for themselves. And I'll never forget this. You know, when I first met Bernie, my initial attraction for her was because she was a beautiful woman. And I wanted her. But you know what? After a while, I started looking at what was in her. And I remember thinking, <clears throat> there's something about that girl. I've got to find out what it is. And so my attraction for her physical appearance turned into an attraction for whatever it is that was in her. And then, you know, she invited me to go to an evangelistic meeting, and I went. And then she invited me to go to a church, and I went. And when I went to that church that morning... I found who she had. And my life was changed. Believe me, when people are observing you, they don't just see you. They see Jesus in you if you dare to let him be seen. A positive mental attitude, a positive mental Christian attitude is contagious to all. It encourages believers to trust in God with their lives. It encourages us as believers and it encourages other believers as well. But last and not least is that it also encourages unbelievers to be attracted to Christ in us. And that's why it's so important to focus on what is positive and hopeful and righteous and praiseworthy. Because if we're not focusing on that, if, we, if when we're talking to an unbeliever, we're just complaining and moaning and, and talking about what's wrong and, and complaining about what's not quite right, then you know what? We're just like them. What have we got to offer? More of the same? These thoughts that Paul instructs us to have, have power to impact our lives and to change the lives of those around us. The true Christian mindset actually has the power to change our culture. And throughout history, we have seen that happen over and over again in many communities. I remember one South American community, and I can't remember the name of that town, but you know, God just brought revival through it. And guess what? All the prisons ended up empty because everybody got converted and the whole town changed. The choice, folks, is ours. We do actually have a choice. If you want to find and focus on the negative, then guess what? You're going to have a field day because it's everywhere. If, if you want to focus on the bad, you're going to have no trouble at all finding it. You can find it in yourself. You can find it in your husband. You can find it in your wife, in your children, and in your friends. Uh, you can find it in your boss and in your neighbors and in your church, and you can find it everywhere. But if you do that, eventually you will most likely find that you're divorced and childless and friendless and jobless and homeless and churchless. But if you begin to focus on the things that God is doing, you know, you'll become optimistic and hopeful and filled with faith. You'll become a blessing to others. And you will be more likely to see the hand of God on your life and see how um, filled your life is with the goodness of God in it. Perhaps 
you need to be reminded just how many blessings you have received. In fact, I think that every one of us needs to be reminded on a regular basis of how good God has been. You know, God instructed us to remind us. You know, that's what communion's all about. What we did this morning was about remembering what Jesus has done for us. It's about remembering the difference that he makes in our lives. And he himself commanded us to do this regularly. And so my challenge to you is to take some time to write a list of all those things that God has done in your lives. List the many ways that God has blessed you. You will not only be surprised at how many things you can find to put on that list, you'll also be surprised at how thankful you'll become as you remember all the good things that God has done in your life and in the lives of those that you love. And such a list will be a major force in helping you to think positively. Finally, the result of thinking, um, you know, uh, the result of right thinking is right living. In verse 9, Paul turns his attention to how we are to live. He challenges us to put into practice the things that we have been reading and seen modeled, modeled before us. Philippians 4, 9. Keep putting into practice all you learn. What did I say before? Reading the Word of God needs to be applied, not just read or memorized. And so he says, keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me. What's he talking about? He's talking about the scriptures that we now have in the New Testament, of which Paul wrote most of them. Everything you heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. Amen. This verse is a great testimony to Paul's integrity. There was nothing in his life that was hidden. His life was an open book that anyone could read and follow. And perhaps more than any other apostle, Paul lived it. He walked his talk. Christianity is not just a belief system. It is a lifestyle. It is about how we live. Yes, of course, it is certainly about what we believe and how we think. But ultimately, we must put into practice what we believe. You know, one of the greatest criticisms of, of the institutional Christian church is they're hypocrites. How many times have you heard people say that, you know, Christians are hypocrites? Well, they're not talking about the true born-again Christian who is um, relying on God to change their behavior and change their thinking as they go on, which I hope is happening to all of us here. They're talking about those people who memorize the Scriptures and they can quote you the Scriptures, but they don't apply them, and so they don't change. And so the world looks and says, well, you're just a hypocrite. You know, you're not walking the walk. You're not, you know, you're not walking in what you preach. You're insisting that I do something or that I change in some way that you haven't yourself. What was the criticism of the religious Jewish leaders? It's the same, wasn't it? Jesus himself said, you know, you're loading people with a burden that you yourselves don't have. And so ultimately, we've got to put into practice what we believe. That's how we change. What we believe if what we believe doesn't affect how we live, then what we have is actually a dead belief. James says that faith without works is dead. That means that faith which does not produce right actions is dead. Faith that does not produce a change in the way that we live is worthless faith. When Jesus called his disciples, he called them to follow him. And you know what? The call today... To be a Christian is still a call to follow Jesus, to walk in his steps, to live like he lived when he walked as a man among us. The message in verse 9 is that a good example is worth following. The Apostle Paul had modeled through his own life how a Christian should think and live. Now he challenges them and us today to follow his example. He's pointing out the powerful and practical way of living that is fed uh, and motivated by right thinking. He's been saying that we must train our minds to think right thoughts so that our thinking puts 
into practice Christian attitudes and therefore Christian actions. Thinking and living, they go hand in hand. You will never live right unless you think right. And the blessings and peace that come from living right will then encourage you to keep on your right thinking. This world is desperate to see examples of true Christianity in action. We should think right and live right because, first of all, we love Jesus. And secondly, we should also think right and live right because other people matter to God. Our good example can be a tool in His hand that He can use to reach another life. How we live our lives matters. We are God's trophies. He loves to point to us and say to this world, you know, look at what I did in them. I can do the same in you. If you're not in the habit of thinking about the things that St. Paul has told us to think about in verse 8, about truthfulness and what is honorable and pure and lovely and admirable and excellent and praiseworthy, then you need to make a choice to start trying. And maybe the first step is to cut, cut out the, the stuff in your life that is contrary to the thinking Paul is telling us to have in verse 8. So let me give you some homework. How many of you like homework? Yes. Two people. Awesome. The rest of you can be like punishment. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Okay, let me give you some homework, okay? I believe that it will really help if you make a grateful list of all that God has done for you and refer to it on a regular basis. You know, make it even part of your prayer life because I believe it will help you to have a healthy perspective on life. You know, when things start looking dark, when, when, when you start walking around with that gray cloud over your head like we, you know, we all do from time to time, pull the list out and start reading about how awesome God has been in your life because that will make you realize, well, this cloud is not going to be here forever. And also make a list of any of the things that are feeding your mind, that you're feeding your mind with that are undoing or counteracting the renewing of your mind that God has been trying to do. In other words, focus on what you need to think about more and tick off the things that you need to stop thinking about. Tick off the things that you need to stop feeding your mind with because those things are going to interfere with the positive things. That make sense? So make those two lists and make them part of your prayer life. And so when you come before the Lord, say, well, Lord, you know, these are the awesome things you've done in my life and I want to thank you for them. And so, Lord, I just want to give you, you know, praise and, and honor for your goodness in my life. And I just want to thank you for everything that you've done and for how you blessed me and how you blessed my children specifically for this and for that or for whatever you might feel led to thank him about at that time. But, Lord, I also want to bring these things to you that I'm not happy with, these things that I believe are not contributing to my growth and so Lord help me to deal with them and then confess them to the Lord and ask the Holy Spirit to help you nail those things down so that they stop interfering with your positive Christian mental attitude. Amen? Amen. And then by, you know, one by one just tick those things off. Yeah, I've done this. That's no longer an issue in my life. That's gone. And then of course, you know, as you've taken two or three off, the Holy Spirit might remind you of a few others that you hadn't even thought about, and so you can add them to the list. Why do we do that? Because we're an ongoing, we're an ongoing process of sanctification. Amen? Amen? And God does not show us everything that's wrong with us all at once. You know why? Because we probably couldn't handle that. And so He gives us a few, and then He deals with a few, and that encourages our faith, and then He reminds, reminds us of a few others, and so we start dealing with those, and then He deals with those, and, and then He reminds us of a few others. And, and I just had a brother come to me this morning, and he said, you know, I'm, I'm really hoping and believing that this year God is going to sort out everything in my life. And I said, man, I'm way older than you, and He's still sorting stuff out in my life. Okay, so take it easy, all right? Don't be so hard on yourself. Give, give God time to fix you up. Because if you did it all at once, you'd blow apart. <laughs> you'd explode. 
So, that's your homework. You okay with that? Yes. All right. Well, that's all for me today. And uh, so I hope it will make a difference in your life. Can anyone say amen to that? Amen. amen. Okay. God bless you. All right. Worship team, come leaders. And we'll just sing some songs. And if you need prayer about anything, then Bernie and I would be delighted to pray for you. So just as we sing, come, whatever it is, you know, the Holy Spirit is always in the business of changing us and ministering to us. And, and let me remind you again that if God ever puts his finger on something in your life, either through um, you're reading the word or you're praying or you're talking to another brother, sister, and and the Holy Spirit, or you're listening to a sermon, the Holy Spirit puts his finger on your life about something. Remember, when he does that, his grace will also be there to help you actually get the victory. So, you know, don't go home thinking, oh, yeah, I must do something about that. If you've been challenged, then at that time of challenge, come before the Lord and say, okay, Lord, I'm, I'm willing for you to deal with this in my life. Because that is the moment when the Holy Spirit convicts you it's also the moment that his, his grace is there for you to actually deal with that, okay? So don't do what I did many, many times. I'd be convicted and I'd say, oh yeah, I must do something about that. But guess what? By the time you go home, you forgot all about it and, and the must do something about it just gets wiped off the table. Be prompt to respond to the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen.